everybody. Yep. This is uh, Enrico Vandelar. He's going to be talking to us about SQL Server 2016 Query Store. Probably the, the one biggest feature why you should jump up and down about SQL Server 2016 and getting that thing implemented. So uh, take it away, Enrico. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I can probably just open my PowerPoint, I think. I'm taking a guess here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. So, uh, Brand did a really short introduction, a little bit more about myself. Uh, I'm a product manager at a Dutch company called Pink Rokada Healthcare. Uh, we specialize in uh, doing all kinds of IT stuff in the healthcare sector in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm an MVP for the data platform. Uh, I blog regularly on my blog site, .9.net. Uh, I wrote a book about weight statistics, uh, which is my second favorite thing to talk and read about, next to the query store, of course. Uh, I speak at various SQL Server events, and I'm very happy to be a contributor of DBA Tools, which is a PowerShell solution that will make your jaw drop to the floor if you see it, and you're a DBA. Um, the picture on the right is a little bit of an older picture. The parent is, uh, isn't here today, so he wasn't allowed to come into the session today. And this is what we are going to talk about in this session. Uh, we are going to see what this query store is. I'm going to show you what it is, uh, talk a little bit about it, what it does, uh, why it's there. Um, then we're going to take a look at its underlying architecture because I always like to know how things work uh, to understand them better. I'm going to show you where you can set all kinds of options for the query store, how you can configure it. We'll briefly talk about some of the uh, things, the options, what disadvantages they have. Uh, but we'll get into those a little bit more later. Um, I've added an extra short chapter about understanding query performance metrics, because uh, even though the thing is called the query store, there are some things you need to understand when you look at the performance metrics the query store captures. So you don't draw the wrong conclusions when looking at all those metrics. Uh, then we're going to get our hands a little bit dirty and look inside the query store, how we can get that data out how the query store stores its information, its query runtime performance metrics, uh, how we can view it through the, the dynamic management views or the building reports. And then we're going to look at the second magic trick of the query store, which is uh, plan forcing. Using the query store, we can force execution plans. And whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, we'll go into a little bit more detail later on. And of course, everything has its price, even though it's in standard and every edition of SQL Server, there are some performance considerations when enabling the query store. So what is this query store? Uh, well, unlike you may think, uh, it isn't a, a physical store to buy queries, but like we hinted already, uh, the query store is basically SQL Server's flight recorder. That's basically the way Microsoft uh, marketing is, is promoting it. Um, the query store captures the performance of queries executed against a specific database. So it can record all kinds of information about that, like the duration of the query, how many rows it's processed, all those kinds of things. So sadly, it isn't a place where you can buy queries, uh, even though that would be a pretty decent business idea. Uh, it is a place where you can look at the performance of your queries. So it was introduced in 2016. Uh, and like I said, what it basically does, it captures and stores query information on a per database level. This means you will have to enable it on every database you want, you want to use it on, and it will store it on disk. So that's one of the really big advantages of the query store is that your all the data it captures, it will be hardened on your storage subsystem. This means that if you have a failover or all those things that would clear your cache in the past, because without the query store, you had to go to the, to the plan cache to get all kinds of query performance information, uh, it will still be there. So even after failovers, you can still look, okay, what happened before the failover? Why was the performance of this query worse? And why did we do the failover without losing the information? Uh, the query store allows you to quickly and relatively easily uh, analyze the, uh, the, your query performance using built-in reports and DMVs. So they build in uh, a few reports, which they, they add new ones all the time with new releases of uh, Management Studio. Uh, and they added a lot of DMVs you can use to just get that information out. 
Like I said, it retains query history for as long as you want. So if you want to store all kinds of performance runtime metrics for two years or three years, that's perfectly fine. You can do that if you want to. Uh, you just need enough disk space to store all that information. Uh, another really big plus is that it's integrated directly in the SQL Server engine. So this means when SQL Server executes a query, it will be it will grab all that information from the query and store it directly without having to run a thread in the background, for instance, that has to capture the information after query processing. So that that makes it a bit. Uh, it doesn't take as much performance as just grabbing everything from the plan cache every time or or after the query is executed. So that's uh, that's really great. Uh, like we said in the the introduction, uh, what Brent mentioned is that it's available on every SQL Server edition. So this is not enterprise only. This is available on standard. This is available on every edition you can think. And a little funny bit about the query store is that it. Originally, uh, it was built for Azure, for Azure DB. So if you're in Azure and you're looking at your performance, that's basically uh, your query performance, that's basically the query store. Uh, it was introduced in 2016, but if you look at certain times of wait statistics, you can basically see that they were building it in SQL Server 2014 already. There are certain wait tabs that start with query data store, which was the name for the query store uh, in the in the past and still is in certain way types. So they, they have been building this for quite some time now. So personally, I think, like I said, this one is in the top 10 of my, my best features in SQL Server. And, and why do I think this is one of the best features? Because this is going to save you a lot of time. And if things are going to save you time, they will save you money. And uh, there are many cases, and maybe a lot of you are familiar with certain queries you need to run uh, to query the plan cache. Uh, they can take a lot of time because you have to use the, the plan uh, uh, hash keys, for instance. You have to do a cross apply to get the query text. You have to do all kinds of complex querying. Uh, but the basic, basically what the query store allows you to do is just instantly look at that information. And usually in a very graphical manner, so when I have a performance issue with a certain query, uh, I have to go and visit developers. And developers are really nice guys, unless you try to convince them they wrote a bad query. Uh, so I take a lot of time in preparing why this query is running bad. So I have to make a screenshot of the, the query performance, uh, how it's running with multiple rows or with a, a couple of rows. And I have to do that and I have to copy it in Excel, for instance, and I have to make a nice graph of it so they can visually understand what's going on. And with the query store, there's just one report you can open and you can give them that information directly. As a matter of fact, for our developers, uh, when they have an issue with a query, I basically ask them, have you looked in the query store already? Because all the information you want to know is there. You can just easily go there. You don't need me to find all that information. It also makes uh, performance tuning available for everyone. And uh, there is a little star behind everyone because uh, even though the query store makes seeing things a lot easier, uh, especially the plan forcing part is not for everyone. You really need to understand what you are doing when you're forcing an execution plan. We are going to talk about a little bit about this later, uh, but forcing an execution plan isn't necessarily a solution for a performance issue. So even though it's a bit easier, you're not confronted with very long complex queries and having to understand where all the information comes from. You still have to think a little bit about yourself. So a quick look at uh, the query store architecture. Uh, like the name says, the query store, uh, everything starts with a query. And when a query gets processed, a number of things are going to happen. Uh, when it's being executed, the query store is going to grab three pieces of information from that query. It's going to grab the query plan, it's going to grab the query text, and it's going to get the query runtime statistics. And the query plan is basically the estimated execution plan. This is very important to, to keep in mind. Every plan I'll show you through the query store is the estimated plan. It's not the actual execution plan, but always the estimated plan. Uh, it will extract the query text from the, uh, from the query. Uh, it will actually, if you have multiple queries in one batch, 
it will actually store every query statement separately and it will gather the query runtime statistics for every query statement. So then some magic stuff happens um, in which the query plan and the query text is going to be stored in a little place in memory. Uh, it, there's a, a bit of a buffer there where the query store is going to store that information for queries. Uh, the query runtime statistics all get their own bucket to store their information and everything here is still in memory. Query plans and uh, the query text, if they are new, if they are unique plans and text or they have been executed for the first time, will directly be passed on to a process called the asynchronous writer. And the asynchronous writer is basically a, a collection of jobs uh, which SQL Server has to write things to disk for. So think of it as a list where SQL Server places a bit of a work order, like, okay, please write this query plan to disk. Um, and the async writer picks it up and it will write it to disk when it's ready. The query runtime statistics are not directly written to the asynchronous writer. Uh, they are written at, uh, at a specific interval, uh, which is depending on, an in, uh, on a setting called data flush interval. And we'll look at that setting a little bit later because it plays a huge role in the performance of the query store, of the performance impact. Uh, but it basically means that if you have a pretty high data flush interval setting and your SQL Server crashes, you will lose your query runtime statistics that haven't been written to disk yet. Your query plans and text will still be inside the query store because those are basically flushed to disk practically immediately. But your query runtime statistics follow a bit later, depending on the interval setting. The asynchronous writer will eventually write them to disk. So that's when your stuff is being hardened. The nice thing about the query store is we can, everything we do with the DMVs and the reporting, it just gathers the information together. So it doesn't matter if the data is in memory or the data is already on disk, it will gather it and it will show you uh, in the built-in reports or in the DMVs. So we don't have to see, okay, what's on disk already or what's in memory and write a separate query or a separate report. Everything is combined together, which is really helpful. All right. so this indicates i need to show you something so let's do that all right uh i have a bit of a of a machine here which is a, is my virtual machine which has some databases um this is the new management studio so we're going to see a couple of more uh, building query store reports than usual uh, but basically the way the query store works if you want to use it is you go to the properties of a database and as you can see, in 2016, they've added this nice little new option called Query Store, on which you can click and you can configure all kinds of things here. So basically, as soon as you want to use the Query Store, you can set it on Read Write, and it's on. So if I press OK, the Query Store will uh, start collecting information for me. Now, like I said, there are a couple of settings that uh, influence the behavior of the query store. And the first one I said in the previous slide is the data flush interval. And the data flush interval by default is 15 minutes. And that basically means that if you have a SQL Server crash or you have a failover, that you will lose a maximum of 15 minutes of query runtime statistics. So all those performance information about query execution, you can lose 15 minutes. Uh, the statistics collection interval it basically dictates how long uh, data should be aggregated together. And I'll get to that in a separate section, how this works, because this really uh, dictates the granularity of how you can analyze query performance. Uh, some more general options like max size sets the maximum size that the query store can grow. And one thing to keep in mind is the query store resides not in a separate database. It doesn't reside or in master or MSDB or whatever system database. It will be stored in the primary file of your user database. So this is something you need to keep in mind. So if this is my AdventureWorks database, I'm basically saying here that I will uh, allow the query store to grow to 250 MB of my user database. So if I store this on disks and things like that, I, I need to make sure uh, I do have that space so that the database can grow because it can grow because of the query store. 
the query store capture mode allows you uh, to set various options what kind of queries sql servers should capture and basically you have none which means it doesn't capture anything uh, you have all which means it captures all queries and you have uh, auto or automatic uh, which says it will capture query based on resource consumption and uh, interestingly enough even though i've set it to auto and all and all types of settings uh, it still seems to capture every type of query uh, but would be normally the way it should work is uh, when you have a query that's being executed like um, very frequently and there isn't a lot of difference in execution times and everything it shouldn't necessarily need to capture that query or if you have queries that are really heavy continuously and you have one or two really small queries it should skip capturing that query but like i said i haven't really seen it work that way uh, there's another option which is size-based cleanup mode which is pretty handy that if your query store, uh, which is configured to 250 MB here, if it reaches, I think, 90%, it will automatically start cleaning up old data. So it will start cleaning up all kinds of runtime statistics that are, are like really old, or uh, it will start up cleaning information about queries that haven't been executed in a specific amount of days. And those days you can figure, you can configure here which is 30 in this case, one month. Uh, if a query hasn't been executed for 30 days, it will basically clean them from the query store. So that's one option you can use to, to keep the size of the query store under control. At the bottom are some nice pie charts, which basically show you uh, the size of your database and how much the query store is using. Um, and it will show you inside the query store how much space is still available. Uh, there's a really handy button, Perch Query Data, which will empty your query store. So we'll turn on the query store so we can work through our demos a little bit later. Uh, as with everything, you can basically configure everything in the query store uh, through T-SQL using an extended uh, alter database command. So they added a new set query store option, and you can do this on the database and configure all the options I've shown you. Uh, just through T-SQL, which could be really handy if you want to uh, uh, configure this on multiple servers, uh, multiple databases, you can just write a T-SQL script that does that. So this is just very simple, how you can enable the query store, how you can configure it. So it's really easy to use. And it is collecting data now. So as soon as you start clicking on OK, it will immediately start collecting everything that's going on. That also includes some internal queries that are running in the background, but also everything you do in uh, Management Studio. All right. Now, like I said, uh, the query store is enabled and configured on a per database level. So what do you do when you, you are the lucky DBA to have 1,000 instances and 10 of thousands of databases? How are you going to configure the query store on all those servers and databases? Well, DBA tools to the rescue. Uh, if you haven't heard about DBA tools yet, uh, you should absolutely look it up. Uh, it's a PowerShell-based script that will make your life as a database administrator a lot easier. And by I mean a lot easier, uh, recently I was at a client who was dealing with an issue that they had to migrate um, a, a very large clustered environment to new hardware. So there were like 80 databases there and they had an entire plan written out about how they were going to do that. They were going to take a manual backup of every database. They were going to capture what users were present inside the instance, what rights they have, what kind of permissions, uh, all kinds of functions. It, it was a they spent weeks planning on that migration and what dba tools does it will help you do that migration in one single line of powershell code if you do not believe me you should look up dba uh, dba tools.io and look at the video there when i showed that video to those guys they were literally dancing through the room and cursing because they hadn't figured this out earlier it made their migration like 10 times easier. They just had to execute a command. I want to migrate from server A to server B. Uh, I want you to backup every database and store the databases there and just press enter. 
and it will migrate all everything you configured. It's really great. Uh, as a contributor of DBA tools, I and my love for Query Store, I've added a couple of commands to DBA tools, which is get DBA Query Store config, uh, which is a PowerShell command you can use to get the configuration of a Query Store, uh, or get configuration of many Query Store enabled databases inside an instance, or get it for uh, all your servers or all your databases in your environment. So you don't have to write a query to get that information and run it on all those instances. Uh, you can just basically uh, you can just basically execute a command and get the information from all um, those servers and all those databases. Um, using set DBA query store config, you can then configure the query store with your specific settings, like your data flow info setting, against as many servers or databases you want. So basically, if you have 1,000 databases on a single server, you can just say, okay, I want you to set uh, these settings. <laughs> All right. Am I, is everyone able to hear me now? Because there I think my audio went off. Yeah, it only went for like five seconds tops. So it should be back. Yep, you're good. All right. Let's see. No, you're good. Uh, you're another good. option that we've built in to create uh, to DBA Query Store config uh, is uh, copy DBA Query Store config, and then you can basically uh, say, okay, I have this one uh, database that has a Query Store configuration that's perfect. So I configured this database optimally with all the Query Store settings I want, and I want you to push this configuration to all my uh, other databases. So it will grab the, info, uh, the configuration of, of the single database and it will push it to all the other databases on a specific server or on multiple servers. So this is incredibly helpful if you want to configure uh, the query store on, uh, on all kinds of all, on all your servers in your environment or all your databases. All right. One thing uh, that I always love to explain, let me click this a bit away, up, is uh, how the query store um, records and aggregates those runtime statistics. Because the way it does that is by using time intervals. And in the settings, I've shown you one of those options that dictates the size of the of the, the interval, which is in default one hour, um, which is the statistics collection interval. And when you're querying the query store or looking at uh, all the reports inside the query store, you are basically looking at aggregated data. If you have a query that's being executed multiple times in an interval, the query store will aggregate that information. So you have to keep that in mind. You are not looking at a single, uh, the performance of a single query execution, but rather you're looking at the aggregation of multiple executions of the same query. And the statistics collection interval settings plays a, plays a huge role in that because the lower you set your interval, like one minute in the screenshot below, the more granular your data is. So if you collect everything on one minute, the aggregation will give you more details about, uh, about the query, about the performance of that query, because it doesn't have to aggregate like uh, one hour of executions of that specific query. The negative side to setting this really low is that it will cost you more performance because more intervals need to be, be maintained. And it can cost you a bit more storage depending on uh, how many times your query is being executed. Uh, but this will this is absolutely a performance hit. And the way I always demonstrate this is by a very simple example uh, where you have two query store intervals, uh, interval A, which goes from zero minutes to one minute, and interval B that starts at one minute and ends at two minutes. What will basically happen if we query our specific query for interval A, and it has been executed one time and its execution time was 100 milliseconds. If we go to the DMVs or the reports, we will see that query uh, A has been executed one time and its average duration is 100 milliseconds. 
In this case, we are looking at uh, the performance of a single execution of the query. Well, frequently when you're dealing with a lot of uh, with specific applications, they will execute certain queries more frequently. So say we have our same query, query A, and in one interval, we execute it two times. And the first time it takes 100 milliseconds and the two time it takes 200 milliseconds. What the query store will do if we grab the query performance information from uh, this interval, it will show us that the execution count has been two because it's been executed two times, but it will also show you a different average duration. So you'll have to keep this in mind that uh, a query can be executed multiple times during an interval and that will affect uh, your runtime performance statistics. All right. I've got a short demo of that. Let's take a look. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the query store using this command, which is basically the same as pressing a button, like the one in the in the database properties. And I'm going to run a query, which is that the query itself doesn't really matter because the query store will capture every query. Um, and we have to grab the plan ID. Now, this is a bit of a silly query because I already know um, my, my plan ID is going to be one because this is the first query executed after I uh, cleared the query store. Uh, what's interested, interesting to mention is that the query store has its own IDs for tracking queries and plans. So it doesn't it use, it does use a hash, but it has its own uh, number of uh, uh, capturing the queries. So an ID of one, means uh, this was the first query executed and it will just keep on counting uh, until until what the end <laughs> all right so i'm going to look at the runtime statistics using this dmv uh, we'll get into the dmvs later but i'm basically going to look at okay give me all the performance information of this specific plan id in this case one and as you can see we've executed the last execution time was this. We've executed the query once, uh, but noticed, for instance, certain uh, performance indicators like the standard deviation are zero. This is pretty normal because the standard deviation cannot be calculated from a single execution. Uh, but it also means that things like uh, the last, the minimum, and the maximum are all identical because the query has only been executed once in this specific interval. If we execute the query again, and we look at the performance metrics again, you'll see it has been executed two times. And now the things like standard deviation have been included. Uh, a max duration has been calculated and a minimum duration. And we'll also have an average duration that's in between those two since it's only been executed two times. So how can we look at those intervals? There is another DMV, this uh, query store runtime stats interval that shows you all the intervals you have. And as you can see, they have a pretty logical start time and an end time. So in this case, my interval is one hour. So that means it starts at 1400 and it ends at 1500. So uh, I think this is, uh, the it's stored on the central European time zone. So you'll have to do some calculations if you want to calculate uh, uh, the start time and end time on your own uh, time format. Oh, and fine after is a comment column here. That's always null. I don't know why it's there. Uh, probably they'll build some functionality that you can put a comment at a certain interval, like, okay, something happened here. We need to check this out. But right now it isn't doing anything. All right. So let's start this one again. I've already shown you a couple of DMVs uh, when we looked at how the, the, the interval works and everything. Uh, but basically, there are two methods available for you to analyze the data inside the query store out of the box. And those are the built-in reporting and the DMVs. Uh, the built-in reports are, in my idea, perfectly fine. I know some people have some issues with them uh, because they aren't really perfect, but they are pretty, pretty helpful. Uh, 
they are easily accessible directly from Management Studio, uh, and they give you access to all kinds of features like uh, compare plans and force execution plans or compare multiple plans, all things like that. Uh, if you want to access the Query Store uh, information on a more uh, a programmatically way, like through running SQL scripts or T-SQL scripts, uh, you probably use the DMVs. All right. So what I'm going to show you first now is I'm going to show you where you can find reports and how that they look by default. Uh, basically, as soon as you enable the Query Store and you expand your database, you'll get an extra little folder here called Query Store. If you open that one up, you will be able to see all the different reports that are available. And um, right now I'm using this, the, the standard 2016 Management Studio. If you use the RC Management Studio, you'll also notice an additional uh, report. So they are adding reports whenever a new version of SSMS is, uh, is released. So you can expect multiple new uh, reports here. Okay, um, Crash, do you have a second for a question? Crash yeah. Dan wants to know, what's the uh, minimum permissions required in order to see these reports in the DMVs? Do you know? Uh, that's a really good question, but I forgot. <laughs> I didn't know it either. I was like, eh. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's, it's uh, on MSDN. It's written somewhere what you need, but I don't know it from the top of my head. Sorry. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, so these are basically the four you got. Uh, the request queries shows you queries that uh, the query store has seen that performed uh, really good and all of a sudden performed worse. So these are an overview for, uh, for finding those queries where a user calls, it was really fast one hour ago and it's really slow now. Uh, you can use that, that uh, report. Uh, the overall resource consumption is, is an overview of the performance uh, your queries are taking. Uh, but the one I use basically all the time is the top resource consuming queries. And if we open that one up, and I have the query store enabled for some time now, you'll get shown into this little report interactive thingy. And what this immediately does for you uh, in this case, by default, it will immediately show you, okay, what are the top 25 resource consuming queries during the last hour? So here I can immediately identify that my select star uh, was my top resource consumer during the last hour. And what you see here in this bar chart, you can basically configure yourself. So you can also say, okay, I want to see based on number of executions or I want to see it on the number of execution plans. Here we have an interesting one. This one already has two execution plans. Uh, and as you can see, like I said, this is an internal query. This is something generated by Management Studio. So apparently this one generated two different plans and you can see all the different plans and their execution time to the right. And this one is really helpful because I can immediately identify that this query has two different execution plans an ID 11 and an ID of eight. And they are probably a little bit different somewhere. Okay, I see a hash match here going on and something different here. Uh, but this will help you to find those queries when you have, for instance, a parameter sniffing problem uh, that a plan is being compiled on a value uh, th that only has two rows and it, it's, it generates a different plan for something that has uh, many rows. You can identify that the query generated uh, different or multiple plans. And um, you can basically select the plan and click the button here to force it. We'll, we'll look into this a little bit later, uh, but this is how you can force specific execution plans. If you don't like graphs, you can always switch to uh, a grid format or uh, uh, with a one with additional details where you can immediately see the query text and just scroll through it basically get the same information like the DMVs. So I usually just leave it at this. Uh, depending on your interval, so the, the granularity you set, in this case, it's one hour, um, you will see how this, uh, it will aggregate the information. So these queries, the little balloons, the little balls can go up and down depending on the number of executions. Um, at the bottom, you'll see the execution plan, depending on the little uh, ball you clicked on here. So this is really helpful. You can immediately see all kinds of information from this interactive report. 
Uh, if you mouse over it, you'll get more information directly from the statistics, like the total execution count, uh, the, the minimum duration, average duration, all that kind of information. So this is this one is really helpful, uh, and you can configure and basically arrange this any way you want. So by using the configuration uh, button, I can say, okay, I want it on duration or a logical reads, logical writes or physical reads. I want it based on the average value and I want it in, well, okay, let's say the last month. Uh, and I only want the top 10 queries and I'm only interested in queries with more than two plans, for instance. And I can click okay and it will present me this information. So this is really, really easy to use and way friendlier than writing a lot of uh, T-SQL code to get the same information. I'm going to skip uh, the tricked queries report here because it's, it isn't really that interesting. Uh, what it basically does is you click on a, uh, uh, or on a query in this case, and you click on the track query button. And then you can basically live, live uh, see how the query performs. If you set on how to refresh, it will just query the query store every now and then and see how the query is, is running. And you can just follow that specific query. If you have a very uh, specific query that you know has issues, you can just like, like the, the live query statistics, only then you can track the query execution with this one, basically live. We're getting a lot of questions around, um, are the, the, what's the difference between an estimated plan and an actual plan? Why can't it cache actual plans? All right. Well, that, that's basically a question I get a lot. Uh, well, the difference is the estimated plan is like, okay, this is what I think I'm going to be doing uh, of what I'm going to do. And the actual plan is what happened after the execution. And the main reason they are storing the estimated plan is basically very simple. Uh, in the actual plan, if you execute a query with an actual plan, you'll also see how many rows it has, pro of how many rows it's actually processed and how many things it has actually done. And because that number, can can change with every execution it would mean you have to store every execution plan for a specific query because one time you'll get 100 rows back then you'll get 150 then you'll get 101 and in that case it took 2.3 seconds and the other time 2.1 which basically means that for every execution you will need to add an additional query performance row inside the query store and with the estimated plan you don't need to do that mm -hmm. There's so another, uh, a lot of people have asked, Ritesh was one of them. If I do things like log shipping or always on availability groups, what, what's it look like over on the replica? Um, I believe uh, log shipping, it, it's, you configure it on a per database level. And I think if I'm correct, when you will use it in an always on configuration, it will set to secondary, it will be read only if I'm correct. And for lock shipping, it will probably be read only as well because the database is read only or standby by default. Uh, so I think it will be, I'm guessing it will be read only, but I'm not really sure about that. I haven't tested that myself. Okay. So I'm, I'm not really sure about those. Cool. All right. So these are basically uh, uh, the reports you can use to get an idea of what's going on. And personally, I think this, these are really great because they immediately show you, okay, like what's going on on my server? What are those expensive queries? Um, another way to do it is of course, by using the DMVs. And I'm going to scroll over a couple of slides and immediately slow show you those. Um, basically the query store adds uh, like five or six different DMVs, which store a different amount of information. Um, this is like the most obvious one that stores all your options for your query store. So if you query this one, you can basically get some information. Okay, uh, what is the state the query store is in? Uh, what is my flush interval in seconds? What is my interval length in minutes? Uh, what is my uh, storage size? So this gives you all kinds of information uh, for your query store on this database. So on AdventureWorks. So it will only show you the information on the database you're connected. So if I switch this to something else and it doesn't have the query store on, it doesn't re return anything. Uh, this was one of those I showed a little bit earlier, this uh, sysquery store runtime statistics. And this 
is basically your gateway to all your query performance. Uh, the, the, the runtime statistics are all metrics that record how your query was being executed. Like, when was it for the last time executed? What was the first time it's being executed? What was its average duration, uh, its minimum duration or maximum duration, its average CPU time? And it basically does this for all kinds of counters. So what you'll see here, we have an average duration, last, minimum, maximum, and a standard deviation. And it does this for all different areas uh, of interest. For instance, here we have the CPU time. We can see how much time on average do you spend for this specific query uh, when you execute it. I can see what the maximum was and the standard deviation. Uh, I can do the same for logical I.O. reads in this case, or writes if I'm interested. We've all, we'll only be doing select queries, so there are no writes here. Uh, we can also do it for other cool stuff like physical I.O. reads. So how many physical I.O. reads does this query do? Uh, CLR time, if you're using CLRs. Uh, one of my favorites, the average degree of parallelism. So we can immediately identify what was the, the degree of parallelism this query used during its execution, which is really helpful. Uh, for instance, I can use this DMV uh, for cases like this. Like, okay, I want the top 10 queries based on average duration. And I also want the execution plan. So for that reason, I need to get the sys query store plan because that's where it stores its execution plans. And it does this in the same XML format we all know. So you can just basically cast uh, the column and get the execution plan as a clickable XML. Uh, I'm joining some more DMVs here, like the query store query, which records the information about the query itself, the query statement. Uh, the query store query text records the text of the statement. And finally, the query store runtime statistics record uh, all the performance metrics. So if I execute this query, I can immediately see, okay, these are uh, the top 10 queries that have been executed uh, with their execution plan based on average duration. And you can go crazy with this. You can do all kinds of things you want. You can do it on, uh, on the last duration, or you can find uh, queries that have been executed more than 10,000 times in the last hour, for instance. Uh, you can immediately grab this. And before we had the query store, we had to get all this information from the cache. So that took way more time. And uh, in this example, like I said, it also records degree of parallelism. I'm going to execute a query, uh, which is going to be executed in parallel if everything's going as planned. Yes, it does. And I can immediately identify parallel execution plans. So in this filter, I said, okay, I only want those queries that have been executed with a degree of parallelism higher than one. And here we are. And I still have the, the regular query I use for querying the cache. And that one is pretty horrible on servers that have a lot of parallelism going on because it has to shred the XML and it can take a long time for it to process all the plans in the cache. And this is just instant. So when I'm dealing with tuning queries like uh, the, the parallelism threshold, this query saves me so much time. It's silly. It's, uh, it's absolutely perfect. All right. So I've shown you basically all the DMVs that are in there. Uh, started with the Sys database query store options, which stores all our options. And basically the two most important DMVs are the query store query and the query store plan. And on one side, it stores the query in the query store query DMV. And in the other side, it stores your execution plan. And basically on practically all DMVs, you can use a certain key to join them together. Most of the time, you'll only use the query store query and the query store plan DMV together with the runtime statistics. Um, but you can see how they are interconnected here on this uh, on this little slide. Uh, which one I haven't talked about is the sys query store context settings, which is kind of a special DMV. Uh, what it basically does, it records all kinds of set options uh, for your query statement. For instance, is ANC null set to uh, zero or one? And it will store it in that DMV. So you can also see uh, what kind of options were used when that query was executed. All right. So we've all gone through all kinds of 
uh, ways we can use the query store as the way it was intended, eh? like a flight recorder, how we can grab all kinds of performance information. Uh, well, one other magic thing the query store can do is force a specific execution plan. And what I wrote here in the slides is for a request uh, query. And what I basically mean with that is, for instance, say you have a query that uh, that generates a, a certain plan and the plan is executed pretty quickly and everything is fine. And all of a sudden the query decides or the optimizer decides, okay, I need another plan. And that plan isn't optimal for the query. So it actually performed is performing worse now than it did in the past. That's when, when we're talking about request query performance, that's what we're talking about. So that's basically the situation we're dealing with, that a new execution plan or, or something has been generated, uh, which performs worse than the original plan. So, and this one is, is, is really funny because what I'm going to show you is, uh, what you had to do to force a specific execution plan without the query store. And then I'm going to show you how to do it with the query store. And uh, I'm going to be honest here, I have only had to force a specific execution plan for two times in my entire career. Uh, you don't want to necessarily force execution plans. You only want to do that if you're absolutely sure. And the reason for this is when you force a specific execution plan, SQL Server will go into stupid mode. It will not generate a new execution plan for that query anymore. It will not generate plans that are better than the one that you have forced. So if you force the plan and you forgot about it, it will keep using the plan uh, until uh, the, the plan guide is, is killed or is removed. So it will always stay forcing that plan. So you have to be really careful and you have to be really sure this is the thing you want to do. So what I'm going to do in this demo, I'm going to show you how we do it the old fashioned way. I'm going to make sure I don't have any plan guides created and I'm going to execute these two queries. And as you can see, if I can get them on one screen, that would be nice. These are identical queries. The only difference is there is a different parameter in this query. There's also a reason I'm doing this using SP Execute SQL because this is the most reliable way I can uh, create a plan guide that's actually going to work. Because plan guides in the past are notoriously difficult to use on uh, queries that are created dynamically or being executed by some kind of application. Because if you create a plan guide, you have to include every character in the query. If there is a space in the query, it also has to be in your plan guide. If there's some kind of funky Unicode character in there, you will need to include it in the plan guide or it will not work. So, and this is for me the most reliable way to make it work. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to clear uh, the plan cache because otherwise the second query would reuse the query uh, of the execution plan of the first query because SQL Server is lazy. And now it has to generate a new uh, plan. And if everything goes well, we should see two different execution plans here. And as you can see, the top one, based on that specific ID, generated a clustered index seek here and another index seek here. When we supply the different parameter and it had to go through more rows, which you can see in the result here as well, there's a big difference in the number of rows here, it selected an index seek, but also an index scan. Now say for instance that I'm uh, in, in a certain mood and I'm like, okay, you know what, SQL Server, I am going to be smarter than you. I'm going to tell you, you're, you're always going to use the first execution plan, so the top one. I don't want you to think for yourself. I, I know better than that. I want you to always use this plan because I know it's good. So what we had to do then is in this case, we had to grab the execution plan from cache and the XML text. So to simulate this, I'm going to drop my cache again and I'm going to execute my query again. This is the same query as this one, only this time I've put it on one line. And again, I'm doing that so it's easier for me to create a plan guide because I have to include all the spaces, all the, uh, the, the line breaks, all the, uh, the tabs or anything that's in there, even comments, I have to include everything. So I'm going to execute this query and I'm going to look in the plan cache. 
So here we already see some things that we had to do in the past, like cross apply to get information about queries and execution plans. And I had to look at my query text. Okay, I think it's this query with this query plan. I had to copy the query plan. And you create a plan guide using SP create plan guide. And what you do here is you can, you can give it a name, in this case, force plan. You'll enter your query here, including all the Unicode characters, spaces, line breaks, steps, comments your developers has put in, everything. Uh, and you run this query. Now, if I execute the second query, that should normally result in uh, the index scan, the index seek and the index scan. It should go for two index seek operations, which it does. It works. <laughs> All right. And if you look at the properties, you can see it used a, a plan guide, plan guide name force plan. So this is a demo and I think this made it look really easy to force this plan, but to prepare this demo for the first time actually took me two and a half hours to make sure this execution plan was being forced because I did some spacing here, like these spaces and things like that. And somehow it didn't want to force this execution plan. Uh, I'm going to drop them and I'm going to show you how to do this in uh, the query store. So in this case, I'm usually filtering on execution plans with, uh, for instance, two plans. Let's see if we can find a query here. Yes, this is the one. Notice that we have our index seek plan here and we have our index seek and another seek here. This isn't the right one. <laughs> this should be the right one, yes. Notice the difference in plans. Now, without all the plan forcing we had to do in the past, in query store I can basically do this. Yes, and it's forced. So just by clicking that, that can save me multiple hours of work when I'm forcing a plan. Because it's this easy, it's also very, very easy to forget. So I can very easily go into these reports and see, okay, oh, look at that, there are two plans, this one performed way better. And I'll just force that plan. If you force a plan, like I said in the beginning with the query store, it, there are still the same rules. SQL Server will keep using this plan until the end of times. It's even worse with the query store because if you force the plan with plan guides and you rebooted your server or you had a failover, you had to create a plan guide again, the query store hardens this information to disk. So if for some reason you are keep you you forgot to keep track of all the plans you forced, it will keep using this specific execution plan until the end of days. So be very careful with that. Be really sure you know what you're doing. We got one question. Uh, you're, you're forcing the plan went so quickly and easily that people <laughs> were like, can you go back and show that again? Just because it was so easy. Yes, I think of course. Of course. <laughs> there, there is another great option, unforce plan. <laughs> oh. And then it's unforced again. Uh, so like I said, basically you click on the plan you want. And in this case, there are only two. And you press the button force plan. It will give you some kind of warning from, okay, are you really sure you want to do this? Uh, with everything, I'll just click yes. And you'll notice this little fee check mark thing appearing. This indicates that a plan is being forced. Now, we Oh, I went the wrong way on mute. We had another question too. Is there a DMV that tracks which plans are forced right now? Uh, Lee Markham asked that. Yeah, well, yes, you can do that. Uh, if you look at the query store uh, plans DMV, you can get all of the forced execution plans, but you have to filter on a specific column there. Let's see if I can type that is in one go. Uh, query store plan. There is a small column here, which says is forced plan. And you'll see there is one forced here. So this is how you need to keep track of them. Uh, what they did in the latest uh, release candidate of the new management studio, they've added an extra report here, which is called force execution plans. 
So you can just open that and you'll get an overview of all the execution plans that are forced. So that's the way you need to keep track of that. Because as you can imagine, usually you will filter this on a very specific time segment, like last hour. Uh, if you force this plan three hours ago and it didn't execute in those last three hours, you will never see it again. So that's how you need to keep track of those queries. So yes, you can, uh, even though you will have to dive into DMVs or get the latest version of Management Studio. Let's unforce this again. All right. There are, by the way, other ways you can get that information. Um, at the last slide, I'll show you a link to a website, queerystoretools.com. And there are various solutions that I built myself uh, that improve the built-in reports, but also give you a, a store procedure that gets all kinds of performance information out of the query store. I don't really have time to demo those right now, uh, but you can download them from queerystoretools.com. So on to the last topic. How much is this going to cost me? If I enable the query store, what, what's it going to take? Well, on average, the performance impact uh, is three to 5%. Uh, that's a statement Microsoft made when, with the introduction of the query store. Uh, it's a bit more complex than that because it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, it depends on your data flush interval setting. How lower your data flush interval setting, the more uh, query information is getting flushed to disk quicker. So your storage system has to process more information, uh, which can lead to a performance impact. Uh, the amount of unique queries and normal queries. Remember that every time a query is being executed for the first time, it will be flushed to disk, the execution plan and the query text uh, almost immediately. So if you have uh, queries that generate new execution plans constantly, you'll have a lot of pressure on the storage subsystem because they are written to disk faster and faster. Um, of course, general storage performance plays a huge role in the query store. Uh, and of course, the general performance of your server itself. So if you're run, already running against 80% uh, CPU load, uh, enabling the query store to make the uh, SQL Server work even harder can have a bigger impact. Uh, so of course, the last line, your mileage may vary. Uh, I've tested a lot with Query Store, I've done the most crazy things from running TPCH benchmarks to simulating scripts with 10 of hundreds of thousands of connections uh, with all kinds of unique queries. And I have to agree with the, the statement Microsoft made. From my uh, uh, investigation, if you leave everything on default, the three to 5% on average is about right. I believe I hit 4%, so that's right in the middle there. Uh, when I started testing by setting the data flush interval and the, the performance metrics interval, the granularity of your uh, runtime statistics to a really low value, it went up to 16%. So those are the settings you have to be really careful of. By default, with the default settings, it will it will be around 4%. But it, will, it, it depends on many things. So you'll have to test it, how it works for you. And thankfully, there are uh, many ways we can do that. Uh, there are basically like three ways you can, uh, three paths you can take when you want to take a look at the query store performance. There are new perfmon counters introduced that you can see uh, uh, information about the query store. There are, of course, new weight statistics and there are a load of extended events you can use. So let's quickly look at those. Uh, for instance, in perfmon, You can go to the SQL Server category, and a new uh, category has been added, which should be Query Store. Oh, I skipped it there. But here it is. And it shows you some things about the Query Store. And this is basically uh, the impact the Query Store has, for instance, on your CPU usage. So here you can track, OK, how much CPU time does the Query Store take when it's uh, recording all my query performance? Uh, how many logical reads is it causing? How many logical writes? And how many physical reads? Uh, there is no physical writes counter to track because the writing is being handled by the asynchronous writer. So as soon as the query store hands it over, 
uh, it isn't concerned about being uh, writing the data to disk. The query store does not write the data to disk itself, so it doesn't record the physical writes it does. So you can use this to track uh, these counters. Uh, not a really helpful way. And like I said, my second favorite thing uh, are weight statistics. And basically, all query store related weight types start by QDS, which stands for Query Data Store. Uh, so if you basically run this, you'll get uh, all different weight types that are involved with the query store. So in this case, uh, there are only 19. Uh, I know in Feed Next there are more added. And of some of those, I have an idea what they're doing. And of many of those, I have no idea what they stand for. Uh, I can guess, uh, but I'm not really sure. I'm guessing the asynchronous queue has something to do with handing over the information that needs to be flushed to disk by the asynchronous writer, just because of its name. Uh, the QDS persist task is also another one that's constantly running. So I'm guessing these two are probably just weights you can safely ignore. Uh, but I'm not really sure yet. I haven't done enough uh, testing with these to be absolutely sure uh, of how they are working. But this can be very interesting if you want to see, okay, what's going on? How is the query store working? This can be a, a helpful thing to look at. Uh, I'm pretty sure these two, the async queue and the persist task are, are rather safe and you can safely ignore those because they are running constantly on the background. Uh, maybe a better way to track what's happening in query store is through extended events and there are a load of extended events of the query store uh, in this case 68 uh, which capture all kinds of things with a very helpful description so for instance if you have very specific uh, problems like okay uh, i'm not seeing new information in my query store uh, for instance Query store read write failed can be an interesting extended event to track to see what's what's happening uh, in the query store or why is my execution plan that I forced through the query store why is it failing why isn't it forcing the execution plan um, there can be numerous reasons why an, uh, a forced plan in the query store is failing uh, for instance if it depends on an index and you remove the index it will fail the plan forcing and this is one way to track uh when plan forcing is going wrong like what's happening and there are many many extended events here and again um, with surf specs and with new releases of sql servers uh, new uh, extended events are added for query store all right so these are just like three methods you can use to keep track of what's going on inside the query store uh, what's it doing why am i running into certain issues So to sum things up for the end of the session, um, I personally believe the query store is an incredible powerful addition to SQL Server. I hope you think, uh, you, you agree with that after seeing this session. Uh, I hope some of you already played with the, with the query store. If you haven't, I, I urgently advise you to just turn it on on a test system, try it out. It will absolutely save you a loads of time. It will help you make analyze query performance a lot easier. Um, it will save you again. It will save you time and money doing that. It will present you with easy to use reports. Um, it's, it's just a great feature all over, Joe. Absolutely try it, give it a try, see if you like it. And it's, it's there to stay. In V Next, Microsoft added more and more counters for Query Store. So you can also track things like TempDB allocations on a query, for instance. So they're constantly building it to be bigger and better. So it's absolutely a fantastic option. I've added the uh, allows you to easily force execution plans here. Again, it does allow you to easily force execution plans. But like I said numerous times during this session, please be careful. Don't just click on the force plan button and, uh, and just sit back and think every, all your problems are solved. It doesn't work that way. It just makes it a bit easier, but keep track of your force execution plans. Uh, this is the final slide. Uh, I've, I've added some additional reading material. Uh, Microsoft wrote actually a pretty good MSDN article uh, on the query store with, with a load of information, uh, including a best practice performance guide. Uh, me, myself, I wrote a lot of articles for Simple Talk about the query store, which vary from forcing execution plans to analyzing query store performance and all kinds of things. Uh, 
the link to DBA tools that includes, uh, well, DBA tools is just generally awesome. And you should, if you don't uh, go and, and turn on a query store, you should at least give DBA tools a try because this will make your life so much easier. Uh, and if you want to expand the query store a bit, uh, for instance, by custom reporting or uh, uh, by using a, a, st a store procedure that gets all kinds of information from the query store, uh, you should check out querystoretools.com. Uh, all those tools are uh, free. They are open source. You can modify them. You can do what, whatever you want with them. And uh, there are some really nice things in there. Nice. Boy, you got all kinds of questions in here. Okay. Uh, one I'll ask uh, Pasquale's one. Or, uh, he says, uh, does DBA tools also work with Azure SQL databases? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I think they, yes, I think they do something with Azure. I've only used it on-premise, but I think they have some commands for Azure as well. But I'm not really sure, but check check it out on the website. Hugo asks, um, if a query store shows two plans and one of them is way slower, is there an easy way to see whether this is because the plan is worse or just because it got sniffed for a different parameter with more matching rows? Uh, the only way to do that is when you actually have to go to the properties of the execution plan. So yes, you can, but then you have to dig deeper inside the execution plan. So inside the graphs, it doesn't directly show you the why reason. It just shows you there is a difference. So if you want to, to find out the difference, you'll have to look inside the plan. And you can do that in the properties of the plan, and you can see on which parameter it was compiled, because it will store a compiled value parameter, and you can see, oh, this is a value that's that has 10 of thousands of rows, and the other plan has a value that only has one row, like the one I've shown in the example. But you'll have to dig a little bit deeper for that, yeah. Gene says DBA tools is indeed tested against Azure. He'll find the reference. I don't know if he means Azure VMs or Azure SQL DB, we'll see. Um, uh, Sasan says, when you disable the query store, does its data get deleted? Uh, no, the data will st the data will stay in the query store, um, even if you disable it. Uh, if you enable the query store again, it will start collecting again. But your historic data will still be there. The only way you can clear the query store uh, is by using the command or, cl or cl clicking the purge button. So it will still be there. Pasquale asks, is it possible to force query store to write on a different file group instead of the primary? Uh, sadly, no. It will always write to the primary. I think there is a connect item for that as well, uh, oh. with a request to change it. Uh, I'm silently praying with every <laughs> release that there is an option in which you can configure it. But until now, uh, it's still the primary file group. Uh, Parasm says in the Slack channel, great session. There's another good session on it from past 2016. If you go to the past TV YouTube channel, uh, and for those of y'all who are in Slack, you can go see the link inside there where Grant Fritchie uh, did a session on query store and query tuning as well. Um, Dale Byer says that three to 5% performance hit is that the same whether you turn on query store for one database or all databases? Does it just affect all queries or how much of a hit does it have? Uh, basically, when I tested, it was for a single enabled query store database. And it, because it all it only captures the query that's are executed against that database. So for instance, if you have two active databases and 10 who aren't active and you have query store enabled on all, it will only count for those two who are active. Because if there are no queries executed, it won't be any overhead. So it basically depends on the volume of your queries. If you only have one query every minute or so, the impact won't be that big. If you have ten of thousands or millions of queries every minute, the impact will be way bigger. Gotcha. <clears throat> Wes Crockett says, if your company does month-end processing on a database, like at the end of every month, how much history should he keep in query store for performance tuning? Uh, I, can, I can finally use the quote, it depends. <laughs> how, 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 how much do you want to see back? If you're like interested in it, okay, I want to know uh, every end of the month, I want to know at, how did it go last year? Then you'll want to store a year. Uh, if you're interested, okay, I only want to compare against the previous months and see if it's slower or, or faster, then you only need to save a month or one or two. 
That's just depending on, on, on what you want to do. If you can store it for 10 years if you want. The query store allows it. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have. I want to thank Enrico so much for presenting this, and, and uh, thanks to everybody who voted Enrico in for uh, today's session. Uh, Chanus did said great session, Enrico, as well. So thanks a lot, sir, and uh, have a great week. Yeah, thank you as well for having me, and thanks everyone who voted. Uh, and thank Ben for this awesome event. I think it's really great, and I, I absolutely love it. Thanks.